want you guys to know that if police abuse exists and you're a victim of it, the Peaceful Streets Project wants to stand up in solidarity. And that's the message that these two have been conveying for quite some time. Debbie Russell and Scott Crow. They're not in it to better their situation. They subscribe to the Martin Luther King quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And they're out there putting their necks on the lines and putting in hours and hours and hours every day for decades now, the two of them, to make the world a better place for peace and justice. And we're very proud to have them as part of this movement and we're proud to have them here in Austin. So without further ado, Scott Crow and Debbie Russell. to a lot of communities here that we're all coming together to do this. It's important because that's how we're gonna build power from below. It's gonna take all of us to do that to challenge these systems of oppression that are, that are that dominating right now. But there's more of us than there are then, and I think we have to remember that in anything that we talk about. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Debbie Russell, local community organizer. I've been a volunteer with the ACLU in Texas for a number of years. Um, I'm also now an elected official as Bell Valley School Board, um, which is really a wonderful place to make change. We've got to remember those small elected offices where we can actually have bigger impacts. Um, and I'm uh, glad to be the first uh, moment of estrogen here on the stage. <laughs> And uh, my name is Scott Crow. I'm a long-term community organizer. Uh, I'm an anarchist. Um, that does not mean that I want to overthrow the government. What it means is I want to build power from below in all of us because it's going to take us to do that. Um, I've been doing it for about 25 years. Um, I uh, am an enemy of the state in their eyes. I've been as a domestic terrorist by Homeland Security and FBI. I've investigated for 10 years. Um, I've had the police sitting out in front of my house for years on end. Uh, they tap my phone, they can tap my internet. Uh, it's all been released with uh, Freedom of Information Act request uh, from the FBI. Um, also, the police have tried to kill me on three different occasions. So I have no friend of the police. I don't want to make it men to the police and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to reform the police. And I just want to be clear about that from where I come from. Um, it takes all of us and it's going to take all kinds of tools and tactics. And hopefully what we're going to talk about today is alternatives to just working within the system as well as working in the system. And you also wrote this great book. Black Blacks and Windmills. Yeah, I want to talk really quick though, make this plug about this book. This book is about community organizing after New Orleans. Everybody remember Hurricane Katrina? Yeah, was well, the police tried to kill us for doing community organizing work there, to, to work with the communities there, to support them, to build their power. And they literally tried to kill the volunteers. And so what we, what we did was we took up arms against the police and against white vigilantes to stop the racist killings. Because we felt it was important to work in solidarity with those communities that are directly affected by this. Glory. It was also about the hard work of building, building things that, that take a lot longer to do. Um, because, it, because solving the problems with police is not just about the police themselves. We have to, we have to create social safety nets. Not only in the government, I mean locally we have to do that. We need healthcare, education, counseling, all of these things that can help to, to, to remediate problems that we have. Thank you. So, so with that, uh, we're going to start with just talking about the problems with police structures. and. Uh, So we're going to uh, ask a question here. I want to get three answers. Why do we call the police? Anyone? For protection. For your protection. What's another reason? Because so we feel done wrong, we can call somebody the same way. To right or wrong, not against you. Yeah, so, so if somebody can step in and handle your problem for you, that's what you said, right? Right. Okay, yeah. So as a mediator? Yeah, as a mediator. Okay. So, what do you think about that? Well, we would, we would argue that um, there's systemic problems with the police, that we call them as mediators, and that maybe there's a, that, that they are not the best mediators. Who has ever had a bad interaction with the police that they mediate stuff? Show of hands. Yeah. They are not very well trained in conflict mediation. Um, the other thing is that there's systemic racism within the police department. Uh, can everybody agree with that? Yes. 
Yeah. And within the justice or the injustice systems in general, there's, there's systemic racism that, that runs through that. So when, and also the police structurally side with property owners and big business constantly. As Renee Valdez said earlier, they came, they started, they were the overseers of the plantations first. And today they still are the overseers, except we're on the plantation, all of us. Yeah. Another current that's happening structurally is that there's the militarization of the police. You see all those high-tech toys that they love to get? What is the, what's the city budget? 50%? It, well, it's actually, the public safety budget is about 65% of the general fund. Yeah, that's helicopters, uh, all these gadgets that they have. But our streets aren't safer. And I would argue that they're actually more destructive than they were before. Absolutely. And we... Well, uh, in terms of the, uh, the militarization, uh, we have seen a lot of that movement lately. Um, the, the thing that's on our side right now is some of that federal funding is drying up. Uh, the federal funding is, is driving the police departments to adhere to a certain standard of militarization and uh, cohesiveness amongst forces. They all subscribe to what's now been termed for about the past 10 years as the Miami model. I mean, the very the next thing after Seattle, when they really converged, closed downtown Miami for one of the uh, international conferences, and basically just uh, railed against the protesters that showed up. Um, that my that model has been taught and and adopted in every police department around the country, so that they're prepared whenever there's another protest like that in their city. And tons of federal dollars move in. Those federal dollars have have uh, attached to it things that they have to abide by. But those federal dollars are starting to dry up, so this is a good time for us to start to take back our communities. And I want to say concurrently with, with the, the problems with the police, 35 years of police oversight, how, how, how much has changed? I would argue, and I think we would agree, the lynchings still go on in this country, they're just extrajudicial, as, as Renee mentioned earlier. They just can't posse up and take people out anymore. But when they do it, is they can do, use lethal force on us as populists in mostly marginalized communities and not and, and be above the law on that. The second, the second strand that really goes on in this is that, is that concurrently is the, um, the injustice system has grown so bloated and so bureaucratic that the laws are of government and not of men. Right? And in that, more of us in the 35 years of police oversight, they have made more laws to criminalize more people for more things in the last 35 years, and still they get away with things daily. Just as an example, I was going to offer, uh, Grace for Breakfast, if you don't read that blog, you should. There's a blog out there on criminal justice issues, covers Texas, but uh, Scott Mason likes to say a lot, but I mean, as an example of this, there's 11 felonies, uh, felonious laws about oysters and oyster collection, oyster skills in Texas alone, out of our 2,600 uh, some odd felonies in Texas. Oh, is there a law? Grits for breakfast. Who likes grits? We all like grits, right? I got a question. Can you hold the question? So we're going to do a Q&A and just hold it for just a quick moment. I just want to read this out because what you said about the cops here so much. Yeah. And they just said a big old police convention. Oh, yeah. Oh, we were all okay, man. I had a cop give me marijuana. Smoke marijuana. On six years. And he was that a was set up. No, it wasn't a set up because I didn't go to jail. Oh, okay. And he smoked the weed itself. The human. You see what I'm saying? So, your video cameras would have been good to have. To have right here? Oh, yeah, we did. Oh, we did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because they're like, that's a jail for George. But then they can walk around with it. Yeah, of course, they could. We're going to rock. Yeah, totally. No, I'm with you. Above the law. And let's talk about laws really quickly. And in, in, in my estimation and the analysis I've used that all laws are reactionary, arbitrary, and bureaucratic, and selectively enforced. Do we agree with that? Yes. We don't need all these laws. It doesn't make anybody safer. It doesn't make civil society more ordered. What it does is it creates specialized things where there's more lawyers, there's more judges, there's more of these things that keep the state enlarging itself. And let's not talk about just the state, let's talk about the private corporations too. They're militarizing themselves. They have private security firms. Are you, are you all aware of the private security firms? Yeah. Extrajudicial stuff that they do? Blackwater? Remember New Orleans? 
crazy, and you can't deal with people who are on drugs or uh, are, are in spirit alcohol. So, so we're going to take them off. But just regular people like us, they're coming in, we have issues with, we have conflicts with them, we don't call the police, and we have a spectrum. And we, instead of just using force, which is what the police are going to do, is we exercise our own power and our own force. And so some of the tools that we use, you can, you can shout at them, to make somebody leave, or we need to make them leave. First, we, we have a conversation with them to ask them to leave. They don't leave, then you can shout at them. We posse up, the two or three people can, can go and we walk them off the off the yard, like actually like kind of shoulder to shoulder. Um, we can uh, you can also use pepper spray if you want, if you feel unsafe. Um, you can also uh, get an axe handle that we have, uh, or you can punch them. Um, and these aren't all things about violence, but escalating tactics that we can use. And, and, and I can tell you that 99% of the time that I've been there, we had to deal with issues around things, is that it's been just using our voices to make people leave, or physically walking people off the lot. And, and, we, and the other thing is, we change the way that we think about homelessness. We don't criminalize the homeless for being homeless. Yeah. None of us should. And so, well, with that analysis, we, we try to provide social services and safety net for them at, at the limited about ability that we can. We're a recycling center, but we do recognize where we're at. And we be respectful of the people that come around. We treat them with respect, and they treat us with respect. And if it goes awry, then we start to use these tactics. In the six years I've been there, I've knocked two people down out of 150 cases. Most of the time, they just use their voices. But, and, and how many times have we call the cops? One time in the six years I've been there. One time. And this is not all dudes. This is, this, is, this is women and men working together, or women working together. And we do it also at Treasure City. Does everybody know about Treasure City direct on the east side? Yeah. It's an anarchist worker cooperative. They do the same thing. They have a, a, a tools and tactics. And one of those tools is to call the cops. If you cannot deal with the situation in the spectrum, Calling the cops is one of the tools. It's akin to a cop using lethal force. In other words, it should be used rarely. <laughs> but it, that is a tool that is right. And in my own situation, I never call the cops. I just do not. Because one of them, they tried to kill me in the past. They have killed friends of mine. And I have lots of friends who are in prison because of the state. I, I have no love for calling them. I will try to resolve the situation myself. If it's, a, if it's an internal dispute with my neighbor, I will talk to them first. You know, we call the cops a lot of times because we don't know how to deal with it, but it's because we're afraid to we'll have conflict. But sometimes the, if, if, we, if we don't want this thing, we don't want this, this entity, we have to learn to do these things ourselves. And it's a lot more difficult to do. Yeah, get your, get your neighbor's phone numbers. If you think it's too loud, call them, not the cops, please. Uh, that just makes things worse. Um, I'm with a community uh, called, a lot of you probably know about Burning Man, right? Uh, the little uh, Burning Flipside group, we, uh, we have organized ourselves in this fashion. We have what we're called Rangers, and I've been uh, a long time uh, training other Rangers in conflict mediation and uh, conflict resolution skills. Um, and we, now a lot of times it's, what, the way it plays out is limited into the event space itself, but we do try to apply this in our day-to-day -day lives in the community, but we are participants in the community who choose to take some time off from the event, from, you know, just being carefree, to uh, actually just walk around and make sure everything's okay. And uh, nobody feels uh, threatened by us just because we're there, and because we're not there with our mirrored sunglasses on and our weapons and, you know, being intimidated. We're just there going, hey, what's going on? And, whoopsie. And uh, so the, the thing is, is we, we have had to call um, EMS once or two, a few times, and maybe the Sheriff's Department uh, a couple of times out of 11 years of running this event, or 12 years now. And, um, but we, that's just again, the last resort. We deal with it uh, time and again within our community. Somebody sneaks into the event and causes a lot of problems. They can put people in danger when you're talking about large fires and uh, think people blowing things up and things like that. And so we're, we're you know, do the same thing. We escort them off the property. We try to get a hold of maybe a family member. We use, utilize the resources we have, the, the property owners who know who the uh, neighbors are and who, whose kid this might be. 
Um, we certainly do not want to send this kid in the criminal justice system because he was trying to break into a party. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. We had the uh, Bastrop High School uh, gave ten, 10 tickets to kids for a food fight in the cafeteria. We had senior items in the last couple of weeks. They had a food fight, and these guys are now having to deal with tickets in the criminal justice system. You know, 20 years ago, that would have been thought ridiculous. So we have to remember the level at which uh, the, the conflict is, and that we have tools to deal with that uh, up until a certain point. And so we need to be organized and prepared before we just deal with that. We need to talk to each other and our, our neighbors and our, our community and our um, uh, whatever our associations or organizations we're involved with and have these plans in place and have some policy and guidelines so we all are on the same page. That's the most important part before you move forward and try to create a barrier between yourselves and the police and the criminal justice system that always makes things worse. And one thing, you know, we talked about systemic racism, I think it's really important. When communities start to take, their control, take, take that control of, of themselves, especially largely white or largely middle class communities, we have to be very aware of privilege and power. Don't be guilty about it, just recognize that you have it, and that all communities are not the same, and that our, and, you know, all of us as communities we need to recognize that each community is different, each individual is different. And so we don't want, you know, when we talk about taking control, we're not talking about George Zimmerman uh, Belanti style. We're talking about using tools and using power and privilege analysis about stuff, anti-oppression analysis, so we can we can resolve conflicts and not call the police. So we're going to touch on a few other things uh, really quick in the alternative policing. And one of them uh, that is a really powerful thing that comes and goes are community patrols and neighborhood watches. And when I talk about neighborhood watch, I'm not talking about neighborhood watches as you see them now with a little sign on there and they call cops at every turn. I'm talking about neighborhood watches where people in the neighborhood get together and say, we're going to watch our neighborhood and take care of ourselves. And not just a selected group of people who are self-select and say, we're going to do this, but people who are accountable to their neighbors. Accountable to their sisters, to their brothers, to their children, to their grandmothers, to the people that are around them and can be called on that. Neighborhood groups are very powerful sources of stopping having to call the cops and stuff and resolving conflicts. Why? Because we know each other. And because we have relationships with each other, and it's important to know that. Um, and we have guidelines, which yeah. we've already agreed to, and uh, ways that we can hold each other accountable. And whether we hold each other accountable as representatives of our neighborhood, um, doing the watching, doing that work, or whether we hold an outsider accountable for coming in and, and causing some conflict. But that we, instead of sending them to the, the jail and the criminal justice system, we can sit them down and say, look, this is how you affected our community. I think that's a lot more powerful for people than uh, having to spend a night in jail and going to court. And, because that's not accountability. Accountability is looking at the people's face uh, who, and who you possibly violated and, and having to, to answer to them directly. Which brings us to the next thing, which is restorative justice. Are people familiar with the term restorative justice? It's the idea that, that the victims of a crime and the perpetrators of a crime in the community come together to deal with the issue at hand. And that there's some restitution that doesn't involve jailing somebody or imprisoning somebody to, to, make, to, make, to make it right in the community. Restorative justice has a long history in this country, and it, it's also sometimes called reparative justice. Um, and, and you know, the, like the state as, a, as entities have absorbed some of it. That's what community service restitution is. Anybody have a community service a, a nonprofit? That's sort of their their bastardization of it. But we're talking about real restorative justice, where we really take people out of the criminal justice system. Um, another thing is um, decriminalization, and I'm talking about not just decriminalization of drugs, which we should definitely do, not legalization, decriminalization, Stop, let everybody out of the prisons, right? Because we have, was it, three, over three million people in prisons are, uh, and, and, and supervised and released now through county, city, state, and federal? Let's get them out of the prison for drugs. That's bullshit. So we need sanctuary cities. We need places that are safe for people to be. You, because, because of economic systems and, and people wanting to have better lives, it should not be criminalized. Or, you know, whether you agree with the borders or not, I don't believe in borders at all. 
because they're artificial, they uphold corporations in the state. We have really need to have safe places for people to be that are immigrants to this country. A lot of people think that we're uh, a sanctuary city in Austin. We're far from it. We have a small resolution that makes a nod towards that. But we are one of the highest counties in the country that are turning misdemeanor uh, accused criminals over to ICE and have the highest deportation rates uh, in the country to uh, for misdemeanor offenses. And so uh, we're supposed to be this liberal bastion in Texas, but we're actually we're exporting more people using misdemeanor charges than. Harris County is Dallas County. Wow. And if you pay taxes, you're paying for that. You're paying for new prisons to be built that, that, that Corrections Corporation of America and all these companies, Wacky Hut, make a lot of money up just to house immigrants. Dick Cheney. Yeah. And that's I also, the prison that we need for elected officials. And I want to follow up. Remember, when you call the police, remember what the risks are. And if you're calling the police on an undocumented person, you might be sending them off to another country, they can't get back, they can't make money, they can't support their family. This isn't just, get, get them out of my face, they're bothering me. Uh, it, it should, they, that shouldn't be the payment for that. So remember again, uh, what the risks are for your privilege, that you are a citizen, or if you are, and remember that not everybody has those, those same privileges as you do, and that you will uh, be a little nicer to you in the jail than they are going to be to them. Another thing that to think about is when we're taking back control, that means that we have to do the dirty work too. We have to take out the garbage that we've been talking about. You know, we can't just rely on other people. It's about taking direct action, taking control of our lives individually and as communities, right? But part of that is learning to deal with conflict. We need to set up conflict mediation places in every community for everybody to participate in and learn to, to, get, to get along with people. The other thing in the social safety net that would help is decriminalization of homeless people that like we talked about earlier, right? If people are homeless, not a lot of times because they don't have access to housing or food, but really because they have drug and alcohol issues, criminal records, uh, that they can't get take the job with dignity, lack of education. Uh, there's, a, there's a myriad of things. We, the longer, the, the, the easy thing is to call the cops and have people arrested. The harder thing is to build these social safety nets. Again, not big, giant, bureaucratic institutions that are all over the place, but in each community and e each of our neighborhoods so that people can have access to them right then. Right. You know? There's an example here in Austin. They have an uh, exchange program. It's a truck that is at certain places at certain times. It's at like clean needles. Yeah. And that's actually been criminalized in Texas for a long time, and it's actually the last state to criminalize that activity. But uh, they're still doing it despite the laws, that just fortunately not enforcing it so much. But that's an example where a few people got together and said, we can save some lives. We can save some lives and get, and get people better access to those resources and services by getting them halfway there. And so th these are things we can do that really isn't uh, you know, engulf your life. But you can support these things, you can help build them, um, you can help raise a little bit of money for them, and that's all it takes sometimes to really save people and, and from, from these institutions. Um, and I should mention too that we are, uh, uh, oh, the homeless, because the homeless, is the, we are on the list of the meanest cities in the United States. We are number 10 um, by the National Home Coalition of the Homeless because of the laws we have on the books here that criminalize homelessness. It's called quality of life ordinances. And we're actually gear we're gearing up again for a no sit another no sit the lie uh, enhancement to try to keep people from sitting in line uh, because apparently they're not humans and they don't have the right to do that.